Uh, thanks to you all for being here, and thanks for this, to Maggie for the gracious invitation to join you all here uh, in this um, symbol of, august symbol of Catholic America, a gym associated with a pair of school. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, as Maggie indicated, um, I was commissioned in, at the end of 2018 to write this poem, The River of the Immaculate Conception, uh, and it's, it's dedicated to, to, um, sorry, to Frank uh, Laraca, and it's also dedicated to the memory of the uh, late California historian Kevin Starr. And I think actually that dedication says a great deal about what the, the contents of the poem. I had, I had two main ambitions. The first, uh, in writing the poem, the first was to mirror the, f the liturgical form of the mass that Frank had, had composed. And the poem in its seven parts is structured, borrowing lines for titles from different parts of the mass, and it follows the progression of the mass um, as, uh, as performed, or as said, excuse me. Um, and what is that mass? Well, as, as Frank's comments indicated, uh, and as the archbishops as well, it, the mass itself brings together Our Lady of Guadalupe and Our Lady of the Immaculate Conception. And so, in that sense, draws together the deep Marian sources of, uh, of Catholic fortunes on this, this continent. Kevin Starr uh, was, the historian rose to fame for his three-volume history of California. I, I'd hate to read that, um, <laughs> but um, but his his what was to be his masterpiece was actually cut short by his death. Uh, it was to be also a, a three-volume history of Catholics in the Americas, and he was only able to publish in his lifetime the first volume called Continental Ambitions, which is about the first several hundred years of the presence of Catholicism in the Americas. Um, what I found so rich in both Frank's liturgical vision of, uh, of our country under the patronage of the Immaculate Conception, under the patronage of Our Lady of, Lady, Our Lady of Guadalupe, and in um, Starr's uh, long, elaborate, extensive, and highly digressive history of, of uh, that, ex that experience is that in, um, in both cases, both the composer and the historian were, whether they knew it or not, answering an exhortation that had been made by Pope John Paul II uh, in 1999 in his uh, apostolic exhortation, Ecclesia in America. John Paul II asked in that document that all Catholics in the Americas recognize that um, with all of their national traditions and their allegiances, not set aside or bracketed, but acknowledged, that they nonetheless think of themselves as the church in the Americas, as one church, to re-envision themselves. And one of the, the suggestions in that exhortation was that saints' lives be composed of the, uh, of the American saints to make Americans conscious of the operation of God's providence and the operation of his grace on this continent. That resonated with me very deeply for reasons that Maggie has kind of already uh, told you about that in, in my uh, youth at St. Thomas Aquinas School in, in the Great Lakes State. The, the, America, the American continent looked different to me as it was taught in our history classes, I think, than it does in the typical American history class. Because for us, the early American experience was not just the pilgrims at Plymouth Rock, but was um, the French Jesuits crossing first into upstate New York and the great Jesuit missions there, which of course were uh, foiled, and then the second wave that, uh, whose most famous um, uh, uh, figure is probably uh, Father Marquette, who um, uh, of course who's, who was at several missions on Lake Michigan and, um, and traveled down and, and discovered for Western eyes, anyhow, the Mississippi River, which he promptly consecrated to the Immaculate Conception. Um, it was a Jesuit tick in the 17th century to consecrate everything to the Immaculate Conception. As soon, <laughs> once you have your hands upon it, consecrate it. And, and so he, thus he did. Um, and then, of course, he was traveling back up to uh, the Straits of Mackinac 
when his health gave out and they canoed to shore on Lake Michigan and he lay down on the, on the, the sands of Ludington uh, and, and died. And there's a memorial uh, now on the shores of Lake Michigan at Ludington where, where he died. Um, what, what that childhood education conveyed to me was, I like the way Frank puts it, is that the, the founding of America can't be thought of primarily as a propositional or a constitutional or a, or a regime's founding. Um, every nation, much less two continents, are much bigger than their political institutions, thankfully. Um, however much contemporary times may lead us to doubt that. Um, and so here we are in New York City, the birthplace of St. Elizabeth Seton, and uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton's story in, in some ways is what we might call the familiar United States story of Catholicism. And forgive the caricature here, but um, I'm a pope and we work in caricatures. So, so the, the, the typical story of, of American Catholicism, United States Catholicism, is uh, to use Walter McDougall, the great historian's term, America is a nation of hustlers. And he means that in the bad and the good sense, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're hustling to get things done. You're hustling to make some money. You're hustling to cheat somebody out of their money. You're hustling. And, and Elizabeth Seton's family uh, was very much uh, formed in that mold. Her father had far-flung investments, her husband had far-flung investments, all of which were slowly going into decline in, in large part um, th thanks to the Napoleonic Wars, which were ruining their, <laughs> undermining their investments. And, um, and so they were, they were, like most Americans, hustlers, struggling to try to make a buck, and they had a sort of utilitarian vision of life. And so Seton and her husband um, traveled to Italy in hopes of saving some of his investments. Uh, but on the ship over, they contracted uh, tuberculosis, and her husband died in quarantine in the Lazaretto on the, on the shores of Italy. And um, Elizabeth and their oldest daughter lived for months with him as he was dying in quarantine, where uh, their quarantine cell became truly a monastic cell. Uh, Elizabeth's letters speak of how her body, confined to absolute stillness, is, is no prison at all because her soul has risen up to God already at, in, in this continuous life of prayer that they were leading Faute de Mieux during tubercular quarantine. When her husband died, she was able to descend into Italy, and there in the sort of the flickering gloom of, uh, of the churches of Italy, she saw the true worship and was converted to the church and returned to the United States, as we all know, to, as Mother Seton, or to become Mother Seton, and to spend the rest of her life serving uh, poor children uh, by housing and educating them. This is, this is kind of the familiar American Catholic story. We take, as it were, the utilitarian spirit of America, the hustling spirit, and translate it into acts of caritas, acts of service, still hustling, but hustling for a different cause or with a different aim in mind. Um, we see this, for instance, in um, uh, the films of Frank Capra, uh, where um, uh, Jimmy Stewart inevitably, um, as in It's a Wonderful Life, is, is a hard-working fellow, but he doesn't get ahead in life, as you know, because he's always working out of caritas and never uh, with his own self-interest in mind. That's a theme that gets repeated in Capra's movies. I, and it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that I grew up next to Frank Capra's daughter. She lived next door to us. Um, and she actually, so here was her father, her late father, was one of the great filmmakers in American history. She spent her entire uh, adult life teaching creative writing in prisons. So she still brings a tear in my eyes. So she, she transferred her own father's hustling into an act of caritas. That's a beautiful story. Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth Seton's story is a beautiful one. It's an important one. In, it's an important chapter in what it means to begin to speak of the American experience of America and even to speak of America as in some sense a Catholic country. But when we think with continental 
ambitions, as it were, the way uh, Kevin Starr's history asks us to, we see that America has many foundings. And to this New York American founding that Seton represents, we should add, first of all, that of the Spanish experience, where uh, I think there's perhaps an even more profound lesson than the utilitarian spirit of the hustler being converted to the life of caritas and service. What is that? Well, the, the details of the Spanish conquest are, are gory and sometimes hard to stomach. What I find um, such a miracle is that in the greed for gold, the willful enslavement of an entire people, and in the event, the extermination of so many of those people. It's, it's little less than a miracle that there were people, one at a time, sometimes a few at a time, who began to perceive in the very people they had enslaved, humanity and the possibility of their having a destiny in Christ, just like all other Christians. So you will know some of the names. Bartol Bartolomeo de las Casas is the, the most famous one because of his great writings on the subject. Um, but the two moments that I think are most, that are most powerful to my mind and the ones I write about in this um, poem are twofold. First, one where we learn that God always does things first. We don't do them. <laughs> and that's the revelation of Our Lady of Guadalupe to Juan Diego. Consider the, the majesty and the beauty of that apparition. The Blessed Mother did not come and appear to Juan Diego to say, to bless the Spanish conquest. In fact, she came to rebuke it. She did not come to bless what Cortez and others were doing on the continent. She came to chastise it and to say, these people whom you are enslaving are human. And insofar as they are human, they, like you, are destined for God, they are destined for Christ. And so that apparition was a call to conversion, a conversion from the pursuit of material gold to spiritual gold, uh, the precious stones of the Spanish earth no longer to be sought, but the precious stones that appear in the aureole of Juan Diego's garment, the, the gold and the teal flaming out from Our Lady of Guadalupe, becomes the, the spiritual treasures that we were called to seek. In the same decade of, that, through God's grace, this was revealed, the would-be conquistador, uh, uh, Cabeza de Vaca, cow's head, came to the United States trying to restore his failed family's fortunes. He was a Spanish would-be conquistador. He sailed to uh, the Caribbean on the, as part of the Narvaez expedition, and they had hoped, like nearly all the Spaniards coming to the Americas at the time, to find their fortunes, to gain in both prestige but also in wealth. From the beginning, this voyage was a disaster. I believe they came with five ships. Within a matter of months, they were down to one. And of the hundreds of people that came on the expedition, only four survived 10 years later. Cabeza de Vaca, a uh, African slave, and then two of his crew members. Those four survived by wandering from Florida along the Gulf Coast into Texas until they arrived back at Mexico City. In that time, they fought Indians. Many of them were killed by Indians. They were enslaved by Indians, and then, through a strange grace that Cabeza de Vaca made no attempt to explain, when they prayed over the sick Indians and made the sign of the cross, those Indians insisted that they were being miraculously healed. And so over the course of nine years, they wandered along the Gulf Coast, healing the Indians as they tried to find their way back to New Spain. And when they arrived, Cabeza de Vaca was a changed man. He had gone from being a conquistador to being, in his own words, a naked pilgrim, someone who walked the American soil, the American dust, with the Indians in search of salvation and grace. And when he wrote his great account, 
uh, the account of the Narvaez Exposition, which is one of the first great literary works of the Americas, he was writing to the king of Spain to plea, plead for the king to attempt to convert the Indians, to take their dignity seriously, and to treat them with the kindness and, and uh, you know, respect of their dignity that um, would be appropriate to their evangelization. And so it was a true act of conversion. We have, it, you all have read in the news about the 1619 project and, uh, and associated things. Let's contemplate for just one second what those kinds of projects seem to propose. They want to say that things are radically evil because they're corrupt from the roots. But I think the beauty of, this, of the Spanish experience is to propose to us that, we're not, that we can be corrupt at our roots, but that doesn't discredit us. It rather makes us ripe for conversion. And that's what I think that's the Spanish experience has to teach us. But I'll just end with one third chapter, and I'll be very brief with it. And that's to return to Father Marquette and the French Jesuits. We all, we all know from the Acts of the Apostles that the one sacrament of baptism actually comprehends two baptisms, the baptism of John for the repentance of sin and the baptism of the Holy Spirit that lifts, raises us up to uh, to the life of grace. The experience of the French Jesuits, the French were no great empire in the 17th century. They didn't have the resources of the Spaniards to just trample across the desert on horses. They rather carved out canoes and slipped down the rivers. And the humility, even in that act, is so beautiful to conform yourself to, as it were, the flow of nature and to follow nature's own paths into the wilderness and then to seek out the native peoples of this land for only one purpose, to greet them, to greet them and to share the gospel with them, is truly um, a beautiful moment in our history. And it's especially edifying when it's set in contrast with the Spanish experience, because the Spanish experience teaches us that we must repent from sin in order to arrive at grace. But the Jesuit experience is kind of a nice reminder that even though for us sin comes first, absolutely speaking, God's grace and providence is primary. It comes first. And so it's with resources like these that we can speak of America, not as politically a Catholic country, but as, um, as a Catholic country truly, simply, by the grace of God. It's up to God to make this country Catholic, not us. So thank you. <laughs>